The new year is a time to take stock, both to look back and to look ahead. And last year we had a close call. It seemed everything was falling apart, but it didn't. You know, the election proceeded despite all the attacks against it. The right wing didn't erupt into some kind of civil war and violence. And the scientists of the world managed to create several vaccines against the novel coronavirus in record time. So we've made it into 2021. Things are looking up. But when you have a close call, when you almost go bankrupt, when you almost hit an oncoming car, when you almost die from an illness, it's reasonable to look for ways to lower your risk in the future. You know, what went wrong? What can we learn from our close shave? Last year was a case study in how misinformation passed back and forth between people who don't want to face difficult facts can actually kill people. If we're going to fulfill the hope of growing into a great peaceful world civilization, if we're going to make progress against climate change, racism, and economic inequality, those of us whose religion is based on reason and the results of science have to defend our faith against the rising tide of lives in our culture. So let's understand how deep the roots of those lies are. <clears throat> You know, there's a saying, build a better mousetrap and the world will beat a path to your door. Anybody who's been in business will tell you that, that is wishful thinking. The world has no way of knowing about your better mousetrap unless you advertise it, tell a good ex story explaining why it's better, defend yourself against the counterattacks of the bad mousetrap companies and build a network of salesmen and lead dealers who will do the same. Without good marketing, your superior mousetrap won't get out of your factory and no paths will be beaten to your door. Americans invented modern marketing. Clever advertising images and magazines, newspapers and television, direct mail, retail stores with beautiful merchandise displays, radio jingles that stick in your head, bright packaging that catches your eye as you come down the aisles of the store and public relations campaigns. We are bombarded by billboards, spam phone calls and texts, and pop-up ads that obscure web pages. We don't live so much in a capitalist society as we live in a commercial society. Now in commercials, it's, ex it's acceptable, even perhaps expected, to exaggerate, to hype, and even to diminish or cover up flaws. All of us understand that every product can't be the greatest, the best, the most effective, and the least expensive. But we also understand that everybody's got to make a living, right? To question advertising is to jeopardize someone's livelihood. And none of us wants to do that. I have a confession to make. I was once in marketing. I made product presentations, wrote ad copy, helped design displays and trade show booths. I was involved in meetings between the marketing, sales and, and engineering departments where we plotted our strategy for the future. And in one of those meetings, a guy, a sales guy said to me, Dan, customers buy the sizzle, not the steak. And I replied, Joe, if they don't eventually get the steak, they're going to go to a different restaurant. I guess I was still under the spell of the better mousetrap theory. <clears throat> what I learned during my years in business is that there can be companies whose marketing is so much better than they're making. Sometimes actually, the people who make the best products or have the best ideas aren't very good at self-promotion. They concentrate on getting things done, on actually making a better mousetrap. And for them, having to sell or hype themselves just distracts from the real work. Of course, the most successful businesses do both. They make the best steak and make sure everyone hears the sizzle. Apple 
computer under Steve Jobs was like that. He insisted on insanely great products that were meticulously merchandised and cleverly marketed. And that made Apple the most valuable country, a company in the world worth $2.2 trillion at last count. Unfortunately, it is also possible to sell a crappy idea or product with clever, persistent, aggressive marketing. As long as people are already inclined to believe what you say, that these herbs will cure your disease, that you can make a fortune without working for it, that this candidate will make America great again. I'm going to put forth three stories, three examples of organizations that were great at selling themselves but had gross deficiencies that led to disaster. And the point isn't to blame them. They're not really the problem, although they certainly deserve some blame, but to examine how deeply it's possible for even smart people to fall for a con, especially if there aren't institutional safeguards in place. Well, my first example is Bernie Madoff. Madoff was no fringe character to Wall Street. His firm existed for 48 years before it was shut down. He was one of the first to use computerized trading. He was a pivotal figure in the establishment of the NASDAQ Stock Exchange. Five times he served on the board of the National Association of Securities Dealer, which supposedly polices the other dealers. And by 1990, as much as 10% of the total volume of the New York Stock Exchange went through his offices. And if he'd stuck to that core business, he would have been very successful and a very wealthy man. His company occupied three floors of a Manhattan office building. And two of those floors were gleaming high-tech offices for Madoff, his brother, his two sons, and dozens of brokers and lawyers. And those are the floors that the customers saw. The 17th floor, which the public never saw, was a different matter. It was a dark warren of file cabinets and staff who had been hired right out of high school. And this is where the special financial business was. Only well-connected insiders had access to Madoff's special accounts. In fact, when asked, Bernie would tell people, it's closed to new investors. And then, but I'll let you in as long as you don't tell anyone I did. These special accounts gave incredibly high returns year after year, even when the market as a whole went down. Hundreds of millions of dollars came in the door from the wealthy, from other market insiders and from feeder funds. Now Madoff claimed that he was using unique hedging and arbitrage techniques that only he knew. And if you asked too many questions, he wouldn't let you invest. Even his sons had no idea what he was doing. His firm carried as much as $65 billion of assets on its books. Then came the crash of 2008. In December, as panicked investors began making withdrawals, Bernie Madoff Securities was exposed as the biggest Ponzi scheme in history. He hadn't bought any stocks or bonds for his clients. There were no spectacular returns. He simply put their money in a checking account and sent out fake statements made up by the staff on the 17th floor. Tens of thousands of people were financially ruined. At least four people, including one of his sons, eventually committed suicide. Madoff is in jail for life. His brother went to jail for 10 years and just got out. Now, there were some warning signs. There were a few astute people who said, this, these spectacular returns are statistically impossible and made inquiries about it. The Securities and Exchange Commission investigated him many years before the crash, but they dropped the ball. And it's important for the sake of my argument to note that Madoff clients weren't naive investors off the street. They were largely other brokerage houses and financial managers and even international banks who should have known better. 
But Madoff was such a cool character. He'd been around so long. Why question when you're making 20% returns every year? My second example of an organization that promised the world but delivered ashes comes from the world of self-help psychology. And you might call it a kind of religion. Documentaries about the Nixium cult tell an incredible and very disturbing story of how people in search of personal growth and fulfillment can be hypnotized or brainwashed. Nexium sold seminars that promised to make participants happier, more effective, more successful, and eventually to help change the world. And their techniques were a mix of neuro-linguistic programming, Scientology, hypnosis, group therapy, misogyny, and new age hokum. Thousands of people, supposedly 15,000, took their weekend and week-long seminars, which cost a few thousand dollars each. And they were encouraged to take longer courses with the leaders who were Keith Ranieri and Nancy Salzman in person. Now, there is something really admirable in people who want to improve themselves mentally and spiritually, people who are searching for greater understanding of themselves and others. That's a, a primary human drive. It's what drives people to psychotherapy and to religion. When I was in college, friends of mine took EST seminars, went to retreats at the Omega Institute or our own row camp or Esalen in California. And it can be a real uplift to get away from the world for a weekend or a week with other people who are also looking for a way to improve themselves and the world. And that's why I love going to General Assembly when I can. The dark side of this desire to go away and improve your life is when it becomes a cult focused on an all-knowing leader who demands obedience and worship. Nexium followers were told that Ranieri was the smartest person in the world holder of three degrees, a concert pianist and judo expert. He also claimed to be a celibate like a monk above worldly desires. His disciples brought in more disciples, focusing special attention on famous and beautiful actors, filmmakers, businessmen, and wealthy heiresses who funded his movement. If you took enough courses, you might become a teacher yourself and you could open your own Nexium seminar and your own center. But the higher you rose in Nexium, the more control was exerted over you, especially if you were a beautiful young woman. After years of advancing through the ranks, selected group of women were invited to join a special secret women's empowerment group. To become a member though, a woman had to provide collateral, embarrassing information about herself or her family to prove her commitment. The women's empowerment group turned out to be a sex slave arrangement for the leader, Ranieri, who wasn't celibate after all. He controlled every aspect of their lives, even what they ate, and initiates were branded with his initials. When these secrets came out, hundreds of people who thought they'd been involved with something good realized that they'd been spiritually duped. And it wasn't uh, the money that they were defrauded of. It was their entire belief system, their identities. They were psychologically damaged and heartbroken by the leaders who betrayed them. Getting into any belief system that deeply is a powerful drug and it's very hard to go cold turkey. In 2018, Ranieri was convicted of racketeering and sex trafficking. He's serving 120 years in prison, and several other members of the cult have been prosecuted and convicted. But Nexium is only one example of how people can be seduced into a cult. If it hadn't been exposed when it was, it might have wound up like Jim Jones and the People's Temple or David Koresh and the Branch Davidians. Nexium looked very legitimate. They had slick marketing. Famous people had become members. They had several centers around the world. Ranieri and Salzman were very effective, well-spoken presenters of their ideas. And they hid the dark side, just as Madoff hid his on the 17th floor. <clears throat> uh, 
My third example of appearances taking precedence over substance in our culture is the worst of all. It shows how people can shut out contrary information, even if it's coming from their own body. Donald Trump has been a master marketer his whole life, cultivating his image as a rich, successful businessman who makes great deals and never loses. For 13 years, he starred in a reality TV show that showcased that image. Millions of people in the heartland of America feel they know him the way that Wall Street insiders felt they know knew Mer Bernie Madoff and the way that Nixium followers knew Keith Raniere. Like those others, Trump has an instinctive feel for what people want to believe and it can become all appearance over reality. You know, if you look good, if you repress any hint of negative information violently and aggressively, that's 80% of the game. Actual results be damned. Now, when the pandemic hit, his marketing genius led him in the wrong direction. Now, the scientific advice was to control the disease by locking things down. But if he took that approach, the stock market would go down, ruining the impression that everything he touches turns to gold. So he chose the sizzle over the steak. He said, like a miracle, it will go away and the numbers are going down. He didn't like the image of wearing a mask that he'd be afraid of a little virus that conflicts with his strong man image. And his followers followed that lead, coming maskless to his campaign rallies and protesting shutdowns and mask mandates. But viruses know nothing about election propaganda and they did their thing. Even an outbreak affecting 50 people in the White House didn't change Trump's behavior. But it's not about Trump. It's about how many Americans saw the evidence and denied it. An ICU nurse in a South Dakota hospital who's tending to COVID-19 patients wrote that some of them refused to accept the reality of their situation. She said, the ones that stick out are those who still don't believe the virus is real. The ones who scream at you for a magic medicine and that Joe Biden is going to ruin the USA. They tell you there must be another reason they're sick. They call you names and ask you why you have to wear all that stuff because they don't have COVID because it's not real. Yes, this really happens. And I can't stop thinking about it. They stop yelling at you when they get intubated. Trump lost the election for lots of reasons, but primarily because his attempt to look like a good president instead of being one and following the science was, the cl was clearly the wrong choice to a majority of Americans. And in the last days of his presidency, he's sticking to the marketing script, defending his image as a winner, claiming the election was stolen from him. He's defending his brand because sizzle is all he's got now. All right, three examples. I could cite many more. So could you. What do we do to turn the tide? How can we convert more of society to critical thinking? How can we turn back magical thinking, irrational conclusions and outrageous lies before they sink our society into the abyss? Now, men like Madoff, Ranieri and Trump aren't the cause of the problem. They're symptoms of a culture that tolerates little lies at its very foundation. Character and honesty need to be taught and reinforced. When you don't teach people about economics, you get scams. When there's no responsible religious education for children, cults find it easy to recruit members. When civics is dropped from high school curricula, democracy can be undermined by the unscrupulous. The New York Times columnist David Brooks said, this year showed that our models for how we change our minds or change behavior are deeply flawed. It turns out that if you yell someone their facts are wrong, you don't usually win them over, you just entrench false belief. And any of us who's gotten into a verbal tussle with Uncle Fred or Aunt Mary, who's convinced that the COVID vaccine has a microchip in it so the government can track her, knows that that kind of direct assault is unproductive. 
still, how do we shove this kind of deception back into the margins of society? If we give equal weight to climate change deniers and climate scientists, the globe will heat up and threaten long established ecosystems. This tendency to hear only what we want to hear, believe what is convenient and follow charlatans, it's not a question of conservatives or liberals. Each left and right has their own blind spots and conspiracy theories. And it's not a question of stupidity. Some of the smartest people gave their money to Madoff and went to Nexium seminars and claimed that the coronavirus danger was overblown. Neither can we censor or repress free speech because you can never tell when an unorthodox idea that seems crazy is, turns out to be an a, 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 a important true answer. Well, I, I do have one suggestion, which is we need to fight back when confronted with slander instead of saying, I'm not gonna dignify that lie with a response. The best example recently is the voting machine company that was being, uh, several right-wing news networks were saying that they were based in Venezuela and uh, you know they were involved in stealing the election. And that company sent, basically threatened to sue for hundreds of millions of dollars unless those networks carried retractions several times in prime time, which they did, and they also shut up. Looking back, six or seven, but looking back to 2011, when Trump questioned Obama's birth certificate, he should have been sued as well. Those are big examples. But the telemarketing scams that cheat seniors, the pop-up ads that sell quack medical treatments, the defective products that companies get away with selling, the political mis mudslinging that rep misrepresents issues, all of these and more are like a background noise of deceit that we need to take seriously. They are the broken windows that lead to deterioration of our whole neighborhood, causing trust to move away. We have to be honest and critical of our own thinking and accept all the facts, not just the ones that support our preconceptions. It's not easy to do that. But if we don't, how can we expect others not to do the same? Well, there's one last possible answer. A person wrote to an advice columnist asking how to handle family gatherings that strayed into contentious arguments. And the columnist replied, here's my challenging advice. Peel away your brother-in-law's politics from your sister and approach her with love. No criticism, just support. When she feels safe, she may begin to confide in you about any ambivalence she feels. Then you can engage her gently. Maybe you'll understand her better. But if you want to slam her husband, save your breath. And that advice is reinforced uh, by the mother of one of the young women who fell victim to Nexium. She basically just loved her and supported her in the faith that she would eventually come to her senses, and she did. I wish I had more complete answers to give you, and you probably have some of your own, which we can talk about over coffee hour. But I hope that by seeing our situation clearly, we might be able to navigate the future year better than we did the last one. May it be so.